On the morning of Monday the 18th of June 2001, 15-year-old Danielle Jones leaves her family home for school, but she is never seen again. Police uncover a dark taboo. Her trusted uncle, Stuart Campbell, is a secret sex offender and has been grooming his niece for a sexual relationship. But with no body, will police be able to prove Danielle's killer is her uncle? Her daughter walks out of the door and she never comes home. She never comes home. To be a trusted family member is, I feel, the worst betrayal there can be. Britain's darkest taboos reveals the shocking real-life stories behind the most horrific acts of familial crime, including murder. Laura had to witness her own mother being shot dead. They took her life, and our Alison's, and our Tanya's. Child destruction. This is one of the most brutal murders I've come across. He stabbed my daughter and granddaughter. And incest. She stops seeing her father as a father. She starts seeing him as the sexual predator that he is. I never thought he'd go as far as to rape me. I ever in a million years. He was my dad. Danielle Jones is born on October the 16th, 1985, in Tilbury, Essex, the eldest of three siblings to parents Tony and Linda Jones. Mum's always wanted a little girl, I think, so no, absolutely overjoyed when she was a little girl. The feel of holding your, your newborn baby is just a unique, special experience. She was a delightful little girl, delightful little girl. Danielle has a special bond with her younger brothers, Ryan and Mitchell. She adored the boys, absolutely adored them. Just fussing around the boys and, you know, mother hen. Family always has been everything to us. Danielle is popular with friends and enjoys school. Danielle's just a lovely pupil. She was a very quiet pupil, very well-mannered, very polite. She was always very trustworthy. Danielle was a model pupil at St Clair's. Her core of friends that were her friends all through her life, were met through playgroup and from school. I know her friends always said she was very caring and supportive of them as well. Danielle's caring nature is reflected in her love of animals. She had a succession of rabbits. She loved donkeys, horses. Dolphins were a, a major passion. She, no, she loved animals, absolutely loved animals. Linda remembers one family holiday to Disneyland, Florida. When we went to SeaWorld, she absolutely headed for the dolphins and she got to touch a dolphin and her dream would have been to have swum with the dolphins, but that, that didn't happen. But she did get to stroke one, so that was good. As Danielle grows up, she spends happy times with her extended family. Her dad, Tony's sister, has been in a relationship with a local builder called Stuart Campbell since before Danielle was born. But unbeknown to them, Campbell has a dark past. Detective Chief Inspector Keith Davis of Essex Police worked on this case. Stuart Campbell started offending around about 1970 with sort of lower level uh, crime type offences, but moving up to more serious offences of burglary of people's houses. Forensic psychologist Dr Kerry Nixon works with Merseyside Police profiling serious violent offenders and she's been looking into Campbell's background for this programme. He didn't seem to engage in residential burglary in order to steal um, expensive items. In fact, it seemed to be more about the actual act of burglary in itself. That invasion of somebody's privacy, that going into somebody's home without being asked. And that's very common in the backgrounds of sex offenders. But Campbell is not just a petty criminal. In 1989, whilst living with Tony's sister, he's convicted of detaining a 14-year-old girl in his home and taking indecent images of her. 
This is a man who absolutely fits the description of a paedophile and a sexual predator. But to Linda, Campbell appears harmless. He was very confident, a little bit full of himself, always, you know, life and soul of the party, but quite, quite pleasant, you know, no reason to ever think anything was behind that, but just, yeah, got on with him fine. Psychologist Emma Kenny deals with victims of familial abuse in her clinics and recognises how Campbell's confident persona gains Linda's trust. As far as Linda and Tony are concerned, Campbell's just part of their family and they have no reason to question him. Nobody invites a paedophile or a murderer into their home. It's just not what we do. What happens is these people wear faces on themselves. They put a front up and you fall for the character and not for the crimes that they commit. Campbell manages to keep his past a secret from Tony and Linda. And they're delighted when he asks 12-year-old Danielle to be a bridesmaid at his wedding in 1998. Linda and Tony spent a lot of time with Stuart and encouraged that time because family was very important to them. And I imagine with three beautiful children and a really connected family life, they imagined that their lives were exactly as they planned it and were very much looking forward to the future. But Campbell's perfect persona is threatened when Linda finds out about the incident in 1989 with the 14-year-old girl. It became known to us um, that he had um, taken her into his house to take pictures. And this we didn't know about initially. They very much played it down. Oh, it's a big misunderstanding. It's nothing in it. You know, the girl's just trying to make a big issue out of nothing. So although we had vague knowledge of it, because it was so played down, we just oh, assumed we thought, oh, well, it is something and nothing. Campbell was the kind of character that had a story for everything. He had an answer for everything. Um, he was able to get himself out of every sticky situation by his use of uh, manipulation, by his charm, and by his ability to lie. It appears the conviction in 1989 did nothing to curb Campbell's perverse desires. While his wife and family think he's doing building jobs, Campbell continues to photograph teenage girls in secret at his own home. He portrayed himself to be a builder, and there was some building work that he did, but what we discovered is that he would always find some excuse for not being at the workplace uh, around about 3.30. Obviously relevant because that's the time that school generally was uh, coming to completion for the day. He appears to be the perfect family man, but Campbell is living a double life. He has a sexual obsession with underage girls. And he is looking for his next victim within his own family. The horrifying truth of sex offending is that the majority of offenders are known to the victims. He quite clearly started to take a very obsessive interest in Danielle when she got to that age. And we had absolutely no idea that it was going on. Tony and Linda trusted Campbell with their daughter and he betrayed them in the worst way possible. It's 2001, and 15-year-old Danielle Jones is studying for her GCSEs in East Tilbury, Essex. Struggled with certain subjects generally, but one thing you could always say, she would try. You could never knock her ability to try. She, you know, she'd try her hardest, and that's all we ever asked of our children. Danielle is set on a career working with children. She was obviously in year 10, and I think one of her options was um, a childcare course. And I think she would have been an excellent nursery nurse, absolutely. She had a passion for it. While Danielle is excited about her future, her trusted uncle, Stuart Campbell, is secretly carrying out his sordid fantasies. Most of the victims are around the sort of 12, 13, 14 years of age bracket, so really girls who are moving from being young girls to becoming young women, and it was quite clear that that was the age that interested him. And what was very clear is that he liked to take pictures of these young girls um, at his home address. To Danielle and her family, Campbell is a loving uncle and doting husband, 
but while his wife is at work, he is a sexual predator secretly hunting for young girls. Campbell would pose as a modelling um, scout. He created business cards called Cinderella's Modelling Agency and he would go up to young girls in swimming pools, in shopping centres, um, out and about in the town centre and say that he worked for this modelling agency. That's really clever and manipulative. Some of Campbell's victims have no idea they're being photographed. Voyeurism is something that sex offenders have often got in their backgrounds. They enjoy watching um, their victims from afar. He would take photographs of girls without their knowledge as they walk past his house. It appears that Campbell is fixated on girls between the ages of 12 and 15, the age of his beloved niece, Danielle Jones. He quite clearly started to take a very obsessive interest in Danielle when she got to that age. So, and I say that because that's important, because I don't think he'd shown any particular interest in her when she was much younger. And for whatever reason, became very obsessed with Danielle. Campbell's wife is expecting their first child, but he is more interested in grooming his 15-year-old niece. I've said somewhere she was a typical teenager, but it was pointed out to me that, in actual fact, she probably wasn't a typical teenager, um, because typical teenagers would hang out on the streets would secretly drink, would secretly smoke. She'd be too scared to have a drink in case we found out. That was the sort of girl she, oh God, if my mum and dad find out. You know, she, she would just be a scaredy cat. Like many teenage girls, Danielle has issues surrounding her appearance. And she desperately lacked self-confidence and that was, I think most people knew she wasn't a confident girl. I think the normal, oh, I'm not pretty, you know. She had braces and I think she was quite, conscious of that. The fact that Danielle was so innocent and was so naive, therefore Campbell could manipulate this. She was the perfect victim for him to choose. Campbell starts spending more time with his shy, innocent teenage niece, Danielle. He would start meeting her off of the school bus and she'd occasionally phone and say, oh, Stuart's around, I'm just, I'm just going to go and do a quote with him. And, and especially once they were expecting a baby, she said, oh, well, they've bought some baby bits, he just, he's going to show me the baby bits because babies being her thing, she was very excited about that. And she'd go off and he'd always bring her back here. I don't know, just, I don't know, I didn't think anything of it. From Danielle's point of view, she has her older uncle. He's quite an attractive guy. Life is still at the party, people like him, and he wants to spend time with her. And she would have enjoyed his company, she would have felt quite special, she would have seen that she was getting to do things that other girls her age possibly weren't going to do. He spent time and attention on her, and there's a lots of positive reinforcement there. So, understandably, she starts to build a close relationship with him. But Campbell wants to take their relationship further taking her to pictures, sitting in the back row. I believe they may have even held hands and are not telling the parents that he'd done that. Anybody in their own right, look at his age. It was 40 plus at the time of this offence. And Danielle, at her age, it clearly was not right and inappropriate. The general public often think about sex offenders as dark and mysterious strangers. And um, actually, the horrifying truth of sex offending is that the majority of offenders are known to the victims. As Danielle's parents say themselves, if it can happen to them, it can happen to anybody. Campbell uses his position as trusted uncle to cause problems in Linda's relationship with Danielle. We found out that he was trying to put a wedge between us and her. Well, why won't they let you do I'd let you do that. How, oh, they're not nice parents not to let you do that, building a gradual wedge between. But then coming to us, and saying, oh, she told me the other day you wouldn't let her do whatever it was. And I told her, well, they're only being good parents. So very much playing one off against the other. I think they saw him as being, uh, you know, a mediator, for want of a better word, between themselves and, uh, and with Danielle. But obviously now, with everything we know, uh, he was doing this for, for, for all of the wrong reasons. That's a big part of um, grooming for sex offenders. It's not just about grooming the victim often, it's about grooming their family. Campbell's calculated grooming of Danielle is escalating and he starts contacting her behind her parents' back. We've since learned that I think he would bombard her with texts. He almost wanted to know her every move, I think. That was going on within our house and we had absolutely no idea that it was going on, you know. 
This is not what we would expect from an uncle. This is what we would expect in relationships. This is what a partner would do. For Linda, knowing that Campbell has been grooming her daughter without her knowledge is too much to bear. Tony and Linda trusted Campbell with their daughter and he betrayed them in the worst way possible. 43-year-old Campbell's obsession with his 15-year-old niece is reflected in a diary he keeps, recording the contact he has with Danielle. We called it the Danielle diary because it was clearly obsessive in the amount of information it contained that was very relevant to Danielle, how he might have spoken to her that day or not, or her, or her behaviour. So very much an obsessive, chronicled diary about events with Danielle. I text her three times, she didn't text me back, but she wouldn't make contact. If it, things like that, but just... I mean, I don't think, even think if you run a business you would keep details about that. Just very strange. And it was all relating to Danielle. He was obsessed with her, to be following her and to be writing in a diary about her, about when he'd spoken to her, when he texted her. This is beyond grooming. Um, this is obsession. He's fixated on this girl. According to Dr. Kerry Nixon, obsession is a common feature in the background of sex offenders. I've had many sex offenders in my work say to me that they were having a relationship with the victim, they were in love with the victim, and sometimes they're referring to children as young as five. In the spring of 2001, Danielle and her family go on holiday to France. While Danielle is away, Campbell cannot control his urges, and his obsession leads to some risky behaviour. Campbell had fitted um, some patio doors um, to the home address of Daniel, and what we do know is that he was in the habit of keeping and retaining keys for other doors that he'd fitted, and, and we found this to be the case. So we are quite confident that, he'd, that he was able to gain access to Danielle's home while she was away on holiday, and indeed her bedroom, where he left the two notes to her. The notes were like, hi, princess. Um missing him and things like that, which you know, one was found in the, in the pencil case and one was found, I think, in the bedroom drawer. It would appear that when Daniel got home from the, from the holiday um, on seeing those notes, she realised he'd been in the house and that I think that freaked her out. Um, and it really is that that was the catalyst that led to her trying to avoid him. Danielle confides in school friends that she feels uncomfortable with Campbell's behaviour and they advise her to put an end to the relationship. Just a few weeks later, in June 2001, Danielle goes on a school field trip with her friends and has no contact with Campbell. She appears to be trying to distance herself from her obsessive uncle. She had a freedom from Campbell. He couldn't contact her, he couldn't call her, he couldn't text her, he couldn't turn up and pick her up. She had a whole sense of just being an ordinary teenager. And something shifted for Danielle in that week. Sex offenders who get fixated on young girls in this way, stalkers who get fixated on people, when they um, haven't got any contact and no ability to be able to trace them, they'll start to imagine what that person's getting up to, who they're talking to, because extreme jealousy would have been a huge factor here as well. He was probably very jealous of Danielle spending time with her friends, um, people her own age. He wanted to keep Danielle to himself. On Friday, the 15th of June, 2001, Danielle returns home from the field trip and Campbell is angry and bombards her with text messages. She agrees to meet up with him around the corner from her house and it is believed she tells him to back off, but Campbell takes the news badly. This isn't normal behaviour for an uncle. This is what we'd expect from a jealous boyfriend. That uncle-niece relationship that they had, the innocent relationship that she thought they had, she now realised wasn't that innocent and she wanted to get away. Danielle sees it from her point of view. All the adults in her life have been good people. They've been caring, they've understood her, so she imagines that Campbell will understand. Of course, the opposite takes place and he becomes incensed. Campbell's sexual obsession with Danielle is tipping him over the edge. He goes home and he spends the whole weekend trawling through pornographic material of schoolgirls, looking for kids that identify with her look. So we know this obsession is actually escalating and not diminishing. Detective Chief Inspector Keith Davis describes Campbell's behaviour that weekend. 
There was an awful lot of viewing over this Sunday evening by Stuart Campbell on his computer. We can see schoolgirl type sites. He was viewing one particular young girl who, who bore a very, very remarkable resemblance to Danielle. In fact, when this picture was shown to a mother in black and white, she couldn't distinguish whether it was Danielle or not. He wanted Danielle. He's put so much energy into this. His aim wasn't just to be close to Danielle, it was to have sex with Danielle. But now, by her behavior, it was evident to him that this wasn't going to happen. She was backing off. It hadn't worked. His grooming hadn't worked. And that would have made him really angry. After months of grooming Danielle and lying to her parents, trusted uncle Stuart Campbell is at breaking point. Is his secret life as a sexual predator about to be exposed? This is the day that life is going to change forever. Her daughter walks out of the door and she never comes home. As a mum, you protect your children and I didn't protect her enough. Through forensic analysis, we're able to identify what we believe to be a blood stain on one uh, stocking, which actually had a DNA profile of Stuart Campbell and Danielle. It's Monday, the 18th of June, 2001, and 15-year-old Danielle Jones has breakfast with her mum, Linda. On the Monday morning, normal Monday morning, Ryan had already left. Danielle, a little bit always last minute, running out the door, and just left the school at her normal time to eight. This is the day that life is going to change forever. Her daughter walks out of the door, and she never comes home. She never comes home. That is... My last... Last time I ever saw her. Let's just say 10 to 8 on a Monday morning was a... not a good time for me. For a long time. Later that day, Linda receives a surprising phone call. I think it was half past two on that afternoon. I had a phone call from the school to say, you know, Danielle's not been at school today. Is she, is she not well? As soon as we knew that she wasn't in, it sets alarm bells off for us anyway with, with any pupils. But I think it set more alarm bells off because of, of Danielle and her personality. And I said, well, of course she's gone to school. Where else would she have gone? Because Danielle would not, had never played truant, would never play truant. She would be too scared to be caught. Realising something's wrong, Linda phones the police. And it's a call that sparks the biggest investigation ever undertaken by Essex police. This is the phone call to the police that Danielle's mother makes when she realises that she's missing. Good evening, Mrs. Chris. Of course, can I help you? Oh, yes, I wonder if you can. Um, I've been in touch with Missing Persons and they've advised me to get in contact with you. Yes, ma'am. It's regarding my daughter. And instantly she's starting to become very distressed now, so this is so out of character. Undoubtedly, at this moment in time, Linda knows that something absolutely tragic has happened to her daughter. How old is your daughter, though? 15. 15. And she's right. She's absolutely right. How long have you been missing her? I think Dad's got small. What's her name, love? It's Danielle. <laughs> That evening, Linda's husband, Tony, goes to see Campbell to find out if he's seen Danielle. He seemed to think he was in, but just wouldn't answer the door, which led Tony to look through the front window to discover that set up in the lounge were tripods, cameras. A bit of a strange time to be checking up on your camera equipment when your niece is missing. Detective Chief Inspector Keith Davis of Essex Police is one of the senior case officers involved in the investigation. It was very clear uh, uh, from very, very on in, in this inquiry, really in that first week of the inquiry, that Stuart Campbell was the principal suspect. In fact, he was the only suspect ever declared throughout the duration of this investigation. With Danielle's disappearance, national news, the search for Danielle begins in earnest. I remember seeing cars with posters in, shop windows with posters in. Um, everywhere that you went, people were looking or talking about Danielle and how they could help find her. 
there was considerable amount of effort around the search, and obviously not only from the police perspective, from the public perspective as well. More than 900 police officers are involved in the investigation, and they search more than 1,500 locations looking for Danielle. But there's one person missing from the search, Danielle's uncle, Campbell. Family and friends had got involved in, in looking for her. He didn't show his face at all. Obviously, during the search for Danielle, people are texting her and calling her constantly because they're deeply concerned. But apparently the only person to receive a text off Danielle is Campbell. Once I knew she'd made contact with someone, I was like, God, she's all right. But then I think it was also, God, she's all right, but why has she not contacted anyone else? I think there was very mixed feeling in response to that message. There were a number of text messages, actually, uh, between his phone and Danielle's phone, almost indicating that um, she was alive and well. It was always our view that these were text messages that he had formulated to send to himself um, to achieve two things, either A, that the police would think she was uh, alive and well, uh, and communicating with him. On the day the texts were sent, Campbell is doing some building work at a house in the area, and the owner noticed he had two mobile phone holders, suggesting he had Danielle's phone at the time. It was to be a crucial piece of evidence. Meanwhile, Linda does a press conference, appealing for any information on Danielle. During that appeal, it's absolutely clear that her heart is breaking and she would literally do anything to know that her child is safe. It's heartbreaking. On the 23rd of June, five days after Danielle's disappearance, the police make an arrest. Police stand outside the house in Greys where 43-year-old Stuart Campbell was arrested just after seven this morning. The builder, who's Danielle's uncle through marriage, was led out by detectives. He was under a white sheet. He was taken to Harlow Police Station on suspicion of murder. To be someone that you not only know, but to be a trusted family member is, well, I feel the worst betrayal there can be. At this point, the police were hoping that Danielle was still alive and they were desperate to try and get information out of Campbell about her whereabouts so they could go and rescue her. So here I've been listening to the interview, the first interview with Campbell. We have reasonable grounds to believe, Stuart, that you know the whereabouts of Danielle Jones. We believe that you have got her or you put her somewhere. Oh. Or taken her somewhere, you know? That's what we believe. <laughs> yeah? And what we want is to find her. Where is she? Please, Stuart. Is there anything you want to tell us? No. Nothing you want to tell us? Is it because you're frightened? No. It's the point at which he gets distressed that's really interesting. It's when they said to him, have you taken Danielle, did you hurt her? It's that when he kind of cries out. They have the, uh, the audacity to ask him that he's hurt her. And at that point, he's, he's playing the part still of the doting uncle. When Campbell refuses to cooperate, the police search his home, desperate for clues as to where Danielle is. A fairly extensive search took place at Stuart Campbell's home address after he was arrested on, on, on that day on Friday. But they make some disturbing discoveries. Police seize Campbell's computer and find hundreds of indecent images of young girls. They also do forensic tests on the sofa in Campbell's front room, where police think Campbell would assault his victim. A number of items were found, including a bag from his loft, as I say, which included a num number of items of lingerie, some handcuffs, one pair of hold-up white stockings that were found in that bag. And through forensic analysis, we're able to identify what we believe to be a blood stain on one uh, stocking, which actually had a mixed profile, DNA profile, of Stuart Campbell and Danielle. It makes me feel physically sick, but I try not to... I try not to think about that side of it too much because it's, it's, it's too upsetting to go to, really, but obviously I'm not naive. I, I understand what the implications of that are. Dr Kerry Nixon believes Campbell's hold-all is his trophy cabinet. Sex offenders following a rape, um, an assault, they will often use that assault to then have a sexual pleasure from in the future. And they will use those memories to masturbate, to get sexual pleasure from. And often they will have some kind of item to enable that. 
So this is his bag of memories to relive the assaults and acts that he taken out on victims. Campbell is questioned over two and a half days, but with not enough evidence to charge him, the police release him under surveillance, hoping he'll lead them to Danielle. What we did see, though, was some very, very bizarre behaviour by um, Campbell. Photographing, for example, a, a number of silver cars very similar in size and dimension to his own Nissan Prime era, almost appeared to be sort of building in some sort of alibi. Uh, so certainly behaviour that wasn't becoming of a, of a concerned and uh, a concerned uncle whose niece had gone missing and had been missing for a number of days. Due to the scale of the investigation and the massive media coverage around Danielle and the arrest of Campbell, finally, his secret life as a sexual predator catches up with him. He's been offending against underage girls for more than 20 years, and more than 30 young women come forward to make statements against him including allegations of indecent assault and rape. This shows us how good Campbell was at grooming these girls. Sex offenders are excellent at grooming vulnerable victims so they don't speak. That is the whole point of it. And this is why we often don't see victims coming forward and telling the police about the abuse that they've suffered until their abuser is arrested for abusing somebody else and that then gives them the strength to come forward. Two months after Danielle's disappearance, on the 17th of August 2001, Campbell is re-arrested and charged with the indecent images on his computer, as well as some sex offences against other women. He is held on remand, but he refuses to take responsibility for Danielle's disappearance. Did you feel the need to spend more time with her over the last six to nine months? Mm -hmm. What was a grown man like you? What was the attraction for you to spend so much time with Danielle? <coughs> His defence was basically he'd left um, home that morning um, with the intention of going to Wicks at Rayleigh. He'd phoned his wife, purporting to still be at Rayleigh, claiming that he'd been stuck in traffic. However, Campbell was not in Rayleigh at the time. He was in East Tilbury, and the police know it. Through the use of a telephone expert, we were really, really able to disprove that he could not have made these phone calls from the locations that he said he did. The net is closing in on Campbell. The amount of evidence compiled by the police is overwhelming. His explanation regarding the text messages is discredited by an expert. His alibi over his whereabouts that morning is disproven. The police find Danielle's blood and his DNA on the white stockings and her DNA on his sofa. The extracts from Danielle's diary and his computer activity the weekend before Danielle's abduction show he is obsessed with her. And finally, Danielle's lip gloss is found in his hold-all. Altogether, this is enough to charge him in November 2001, five months after she went missing with the abduction and murder of his niece, Danielle Jones. I think it was very hard for me to actually um, admit to myself that she was then dead. Even though Tony and Linda knew that Campbell had some involvement, to have that confirmed, to realise that the man who'd come round for dinner, who'd been with your sister, who'd had your daughter as a bridesmaid at their wedding, was responsible for her murder, is unthinkable. I think he's the most despicable, repulsive thing there is. I don't know of a word other than monster that could describe him. As a mum, you protect your children and I didn't protect her enough. With the trial date set for October 2002, will Linda find out what happened to her beloved daughter that Monday morning? And will Campbell's 20 years of abusing young women finally come to an end. He had got away with systematically abusing people all his life, and he thought right until the very end that he could get away with the ultimate crime. I personally believe that she left home at 10 to 8, I think by the lunchtime. I think she was already dead. 
On the 17th of October 2002 at Chelmsford Crown Court, Stuart Campbell is on trial for the abduction and murder of his niece, Danielle Jones. Senior case officers Keith Davis and Steve Rawson of Essex Police take us through the last sighting of Danielle on the morning of her disappearance, charting events that mark the brutal climax of Campbell's obsession with his 15-year-old niece. But would this evidence be compelling enough for a conviction? So we're outside number five, Hale, um, on East Tilbury, and it was Monday the 18th, 2001, when Danielle was getting ready for school here around about 7.55. Clearly something um, caught her eye and unusually she just turned around and started walking the other way. My view is that she would have seen maybe Stuart Campbell's blue transit van uh, and thought, I don't want to see him, I'm going to take an alternative route. Okay, so we're taking a route now that Daniel we know would have taken past Five Hour home address and it's as she's walking past Five Hour that her brother Mitchell sees Daniel walking past, so confirmation that she's walking back towards Solway. We think Danielle got to this point. We had a witness who lived in one of these flats that saw a girl in a St Clair's school uniform arguing with a guy, and she actually heard the girl say, go away, leave me alone. Shortly after, we've got another witness who did know Danielle, saw her crossing in the junction of Clyde over here, and at the lamppost on the other side of the road there, we have another witness who saw a blue van and Danielle arguing with the driver of that vehicle. Crucially important, and that was the reason why the jury, the judge, and indeed the defence and prosecution visited this site prior to the trial, because we believe they had how important these sightings were, not only to show the route that Daniel was taking, clearly intent on trying to catch the bus that morning, clearly intent on trying to avoid an individual who he believed to be Stuart Campbell. So this is Queen Elizabeth Avenue, and this is where the school bus stopped for the school children to alight before departing for the school. Daniel never made that school bus. And we know that a witness saw Daniel getting into a blue transit van at 8.15 that morning in a road called Arran, which is just down here on the right-hand side. OK, this is Stamford Road. Now, this is a very relevant sighting because this would have been the most natural route for Campbell to go home to Grades. And there's two witnesses who live in this vicinity and they give evidence of seeing a blue transit van similar to that of Stuart Campbell's with a young girl slumped in the passenger seat of that vehicle. So evidentially, this is probably the last sighting of the person we believe to be Danielle on that day. Um, the fact that she was seen slumped in the passenger seat of the car might be relevant in relation to a piece of paper that was found in Stuart Campbell's house that had three things written on it. It had the word chloroform written on it, it had the word taser written on it, and it had Danielle's PIN number for a mobile phone. The court hears how the prosecution believe Campbell took Danielle to his home that Monday morning, where he sexually assaulted and murdered her before disposing of her body. I personally believe that she left home at 10 to 8, I think by the lunchtime. I think she was already dead. Dr Kerry Nixon believes Campbell murdered Danielle because she was about to expose his secret life as a sex offender. People had fallen for his lies all his life. He had got away with systematically abusing people all his life. And he thought right until the very end that he could get away with the ultimate crime, which was the murder of Danielle. Despite a huge amount of evidence pointing to Campbell being Danielle's killer, it's her lip gloss which was found in his holdall that was crucial to getting a conviction. Danielle's friend tells the court that the lip gloss had been bought at Lakeside Shopping Centre just one week prior to Danielle's disappearance. The only time that that could have been taken by Campbell and retained by him would have been on that relevant day in question, Monday the 18th of June, the day that Danielle went missing. On the 12th of December 2002, Campbell is found guilty of the abduction and murder of Danielle Jones. The judge sentences him to life imprisonment and orders him to serve a minimum of 20 years for the murder and 10 years for the abduction to run concurrently. Elation's not the word. I don't know, just... Got you. Get that smug look off your face. You're done, mate, you know? But the torment of not knowing what happened to Danielle is unbearable for Linda. 
she had a fear of being buried and to know that it's probably exactly what happened to her. Having no body, never being able to lay your child to rest, never hearing the person who murdered her acknowledge it, is such a difficult situation to come to terms with. Campbell is serving a life sentence for Danielle's murder, but he still won't tell anyone how he killed her or where she is. This is a family that he'd spent an awful lot of time with, so to betray that trust in the first instant uh, is a very difficult thing to understand and comprehend. To perpetuate that mistrust and, and not give something back to the family that they so desperately want, and that's Danielle. And the fact that he won't give us that one piece. I've accepted that he won't, um, but to not be able to bury her and know where she is and is an everyday torturous position. Danielle would be devastated if she could see her mum and the anguish she's in. And according to Campbell, he had this close relationship with Danielle. She was his niece, she was the bridesmaid at her wedding. He protected her. In his words, he loved her. Well, if somebody thought anything of an individual, they would want to make sure that her family were able to grieve and able to say goodbye. By not giving her family that information, he is proving yet again that that's all lies. He didn't care for Danielle. He didn't love Danielle. He was a cold, depraved predator who just used young girls for his own selfish means. We've not been given the chance to say goodbye to her properly. Death is final. Of course it is. We know that. And even though it's just a body, the person's no longer there. The fact that that body, that was something that they created. To have that taken away by somebody, to not be able to touch the earth where your child is, or to hold the urn where you know that their ashes are, it's so tragic. It's the one thing that feels like you still have them. Although there is no graveside, a memorial garden for Danielle has been built at a school. For us, it's really important to have somewhere to go. As I say, normally you'd have a grave. We don't have that. We've got all our memories indoors, but I think sometimes you need somewhere to go and lay flowers and just have a bit of peace. As hard as it is to come here, I think also it's, it makes you almost feel like you're, you're with her in happier times when she was a schoolgirl. With the love of her family, Linda has found the strength to carry on. We've got through 12 years and we're close and strong and we'll be fine. My family is the most precious thing in my life. The fact that we had two younger sons, I had them to live for as well, so that, that pulled me through, the boys pulled me through it. Definitely, definitely. In spite of the tragedy of losing their daughter, Linda and Tony stayed together. They've raised two great boys, and in spite of their loss, they have continued on with their own journeys, and they've done this well. The reality is, no matter what we were going through, you cannot survive without laughing, and we've, we've sort of learned that. We do have days where we have go out, we go on holiday, we have wonderful times with our family, and there is a bit of guilt there. Yeah, but we also realise the boys are alive. We, we have lives to get on with. Campbell has not destroyed their future. 
Having said that, the gap that's been left by Daniel is enormous and it'll never be filled. And in a way, they won't ever want to fill it because Daniel was very, very important to them and deserves that space. But he didn't destroy them. He didn't destroy that family. And they continue today to live happily together. And that's something that he will never have. And Danielle is always in Mum Linda's thoughts. She was beautiful, fun-loving girl. She had everything to live for. I miss her every minute of every day.